Welcome to this week's episode of Zero to a Million brought to you by Unstack, the only no-code headless landing page builder that is fully integrated with Shopify. I'm your host, Zach Rigo. Today, I'm joined by Rob Frazier, founder and CEO of Endure Apparel, an incredibly cool performance sock company that is creating unique, stylish, really fun socks that any any performance uh, athlete can use to really show their personality. And I'm, I'm excited to talk to Rob. It's been a cool journey. Uh, I've been following him on LinkedIn. So Rob, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, my pleasure. Zach, thanks for having me on. Yeah. So t- take me through uh, the background of the brand and kind of the the real genesis for, for creating it. Yeah. So the kind of quick and dirty there is in late 2016, um, started and founded the brand. You know, at the time I was kind of in this sort of transitional period where the the prior 10 years, I was actually racing mountain bikes competitively um, five times on the Canadian national team, traveling the world, representing our country um, at multiple world championships. And, and honestly thought that was going to be my pathway in life um, as I got older, you know, living the professional athlete life. But as you do, you, you grow up a little bit and realize that, um, you need a lot more money than you once thought to uh, sustain your life over time. Um, and my sport in particular is is not one of the, the more heavily funded sports, at least from our, our government or even sponsorship standpoint. And, and to be honest, I wasn't hitting um, the level in which I would need to kind of make it a long term um, uh, financially stable uh job or career for me. So, you know, in my early 20s, I made the decision to walk away from the sport while still fairly competitive and kind of shift my focus on what's next. Um, At that time, I didn't know. Um, I didn't really have prior entrepreneurial experience, although in hindsight, sport and the athlete journey is very entrepreneurial. There's a lot of kind of parallels there um, and lessons learned. I think I've made it uh, the transition uh, smoother than had I had no other kind of prior experience. But um, yeah. So like I went back to school at that time, I was like, maybe I'll help other athletes. And I was going to school for sport management. Um, and then just, you know, waking up every morning, not having that fire in my belly anymore, something excited, look forward to some big, you know, hairy, audacious goal. And, you know, going into my second year of school, I was like, I'm gonna try to start a business, you know, like, it seems like a, a fun opportunity. I'll learn something at the very least. I didn't have any experience or, or real goals. I just wanted to occupy my time and really shoot for the stars. So um, laying in bed, just kind of came up with a name, an idea. Uh, you know, the first and foremost kind of goal was to create a brand in the athletic space. Um, short of the name, short of anything else, I wanted to create a brand or community around the idea of just achieving or going after your own personal best, whatever that may be. Um, and then calling to my roots as a cyclist, you know, socks were culture. They're the way that we express ourselves on and off the bike. Mm. Um, so I was like, okay, a cool first product category would be marrying the performance aspect of gear and socks, which were at the time very sports specific. It was either cycling socks or running socks or uh, gym socks or basketball socks. I was like, well, this is kind of silly. As the world shifted towards um, athleisure wear, I felt socks had been left behind. So I was like, I'm going to create a great technical all day performance sock. And then from there, I want to apply really fun, original, expressive design and marry the two. Um, And so that was kind of the first product category idea. Um, Taught myself all the basics around design, you know, Illustrator, Photoshop, uh, sourced my own manufacturers. Really, the true entrepreneur just kind of grit. I had a thousand bucks to invest. Uh, I put all that money into getting the Shopify store up, an Instagram page, and uh, ordered my first batch of socks, 230 pairs, and then hit the pavement, mm-hmm. selling them at school. That was kind of the genesis. Awesome. So there was not a lot of magic or, or superpowers or super genius plan. It, uh, it truly was just kind of like the good old hustle. Yeah, thousand bucks. It's amazing. That's and that's yeah. part of part of the the growth of Shopify has been enabling you know folks to start a business with with a thousand bucks. But I, I also uh, you know going and getting the inventory is is challenging. How how did you source that first sample and you know make sure the product that you felt really good about performance performance materials are there, but like having not having that experience, how did you go about kind of getting that first sample, getting a product you felt good about going and spending your thousand bucks on ordering you know two hundred and thirty of them. Yeah, like I'd say like coming from like a sport background, my risk tolerance was like a little higher. So like I wasn't overly concerned with like the thousand dollars and getting the perfect product. Um, right. Like I've always been a fan of just like moving fast and iterating as we go. So like the concept of a minimal viable product, I was like, okay, well, like what are the basics here? And I also knew my limitations. And I think this is 
an important lesson for young entrepreneurs is like, you don't need to be perfect and you don't have all of the answers when you start. So I really just looked to like what made great socks that I liked prior. So I started to kind of go to all the competitor socks and be like, Hey, I like these features. And I can look on the back of the packaging and be like, these are the yarn compositions. And so mm. I could distill down at least the very basics of like, what is the yarn composition that makes a performance sock? You know, is it X percent polyester, nylon, spandex, elastic, et cetera. Um, and then from there, it's like, okay, I'll start with one height. And my favorite height was crew sock. It falls just below the calf. Simple enough. I'll start with one size that fits the broad range of people I want to sell to. Um, and then from there, I'll just design it how I like it. So I, I kept it really simple. You know, I, I leveraged a lot of what already existed. And then when it came to finding a factory, again, there's a lot of online resources like AliExpress or Alibaba and AliExpress. Um, or just reverse engineering where others are getting their their socks made. These are little hubs all over the world, you know, depending on what you want to manufacture. Um, generally, it's pretty concentrated in, in specific regions of the world. Um, so I found that region. And then within that region, there's lots of factories. And you just start negotiating things like, uh, you know, your minimum order quantity, um, how fast you can get them, et cetera. And, and that's the real challenge as a, a young entrepreneur in, in, in sourcing product is, you have a limited amount of resources and you need to find a manufacturer that can uphold the quality, but meet low minimum quantities. So that was definitely a challenge, but we found someone sold them on the, the future state of the business. You know, we'll be doing millions of dollars in sales in no time, but Oh yeah, I only need like 200 pairs right now. <laughs> um, so um, that, that's kind of how I went about it again, not trying to reinvent the wheel and just trying to find someone to bet on us. And you get that first order grassroots. You're kind of going around school selling them. How did the business evolve in the early days to, you mentioned the Shopify store early, but, you know, kind of building online and building that digital experience? Yeah, it was like a slow burn for sure. Like the first 230 pairs were all sold just by me carrying them around in a kind of plastic bin around school. Um, and then the next inventory I got in, you know, on a little under a thousand pairs, I put them on Shopify and of course, the first sales are like close friends, my mom, my aunts, uncles, neighbors, because um, uh, I didn't have any money to advertise at that point too. So it was really just my own network. And then from there to get some like initial traction, I was like, well, I came from the cycling world and I knew a bunch of athletes. So let's create like a little micro influencer network and get some brand ambassadors to help start promoting the brand. Started the Instagram page that started to get some traction and slowly but surely, over time, you see a sale come in and, oh, I don't know that name. And that's pretty cool. Um, but like we're talking one sale a day sometimes, sometimes zero sales a day. Like this was a very long, slow burn. Over a year in, there were some days where we wouldn't have one Shopify sale. You know, so it's like these things take time. Uh, we didn't really start paying to, to acquire customers for at least two years in. Um, but yeah, so it's just kind of like getting the product out there, finding all the organic ways like ambassadors, organic social media, showing up to events um, locally. Like we live in Victoria, BC, um, pre-COVID. Obviously, there was a lot of kind of cycling events every weekend, running events, expos, fitness uh, expos, et cetera. So we'd show up, promote, hand out the product. It would have a call back to the website and there would be some organic repeat purchases that way. And it just takes a long time to fill that, that uh, funnel and get the flywheel spinning. But uh, we really just kind of like, figured, asked ourselves, what are all the free ways we can show up in the market and try and generate some awareness? Um, so that was really the start of the, of the selling online. I love that. And, and what was the big catalyst? Like when did the business really start to take, you know, hold and you say, okay, this is going to be something I'm going to run with and, you know, going to be able to pay myself what I need to be paid, you know, that, that maybe fulfills the void that you felt when you were doing cycling and realizing you need more money to live than you thought. <laughs> Yeah, I think like that, that initial decision to go all in, there's still a lot of unknown. So like I was still working part-time jobs and going to school while starting it. But after, wow. um, after a year, we generated, a, um, you know, mid six figures. So like under half, half a million bucks in our first year, but it was a huge success compared to like where it started. Um, Cause like, you know, if I made 20 grand, I would have been stoked, but we made, you know, close to half a million in our first year. So that's when I decided like, okay, I'm going to give this a real shot. Even at that time, I'm paying myself like nothing, a thousand dollars a month, like not even cover my rent. Um, but I was like, I got to go for it and really like lean in. So that's what people, I often get that question too from young entrepreneurs of like, when do you know you could just like go all in and make enough yeah. money? It's like, you never really know, like we're doing great today and you still like, there's unknowns, you know, it's like, you never are like, there's never a black and white 
like, okay, yes, today's the day that where I can pay myself and like, know for sure in the future, nothing's going to go wrong. And I can pay myself like, so you always have to just take it, make a judgment call. What I did know is that the traction was there and I believed in what we were doing. Um, and so at some point you have to go all in on it and bet on yourself. And so I'd say it was about a year, year and a half in when I like let all the part-time jobs go short of one on the weekend, I would still just work at a bike shop, um, just to generate a little bit extra money. Cause like I said, I was paying myself a grand. So I needed to bring in at least another few hundred bucks to a grand a month to just even stay above water. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's kind of like the long and short of that. That's amazing. And, you know, I think what, the biggest growth and kind of the, the, the real catalyst for the business growing, you know, exponentially happened. I think you mentioned, you know, kind of at the beginning of COVID, the, you know, people moving online to buy items. I'd love to hear kind of your thought process and how you felt like you all were able to capitalize on uh, at home fitness and people getting out and running as a, as a new fitness trend, as opposed to maybe going to the gym historically and, and more importantly, you know, capitalize on the traffic that came to your site. Yeah. So once like, if we look at COVID kind of hitting in North America, March of 2020, we had been in business for a little over three years at that point. Um, and so it's not like there hadn't been some success at that point, you know, like the year prior we had done over a million dollars in sales. And so like we had hired some people, we had traction and the business was growing. Um, but definitely, you know, when COVID hit, um, we had been working really hard up to that point to build a solid brand, you know, build that flywheel and build a really solid kind of user experience and way to buy socks online that was, in our opinion, better than anything else out there, where at the time, the majority of our competition were sold through wholesale as a first channel. So you would go into, you know, here in Canada, like one of the big sports stores, Sport Check, and you would see all the Nike socks or all these other branded socks, and you would kind of pick the ones that, that talk to you. And you know, overnight, those stores all had to shut down. Um, and with no kind of idea, you know, two week lockdown that is still kind of rolling through um, two years later, um, no idea when the stores would come back on. So, you know, immediately buying behavior shifts into online e commerce. And it obviously it had been shifting that way. That's the trend over the last many years, five to 10 years. But this accelerated and brought the, the, the future forward, um, like uh, 10 years, I would say. So um, kind of COVID hit. It was tough for a couple of months because our supply chains were impacted and we weren't sure how, like, how things would shake out. But once May 2020 hit, um, it was pretty obvious that we were catching a bit of a tailwind. Um, we had positioned ourselves well for the opportunity Um a bunch of different sort of market conditions collided. So like the one obvious one with COVID was everyone's buying online. The second one is there was now an emphasis on living a healthier, active lifestyle because that was, you know, what people were shifting their focus to. They're all at home. Like, what do I do with my time? Home workouts started to boom, getting outside in the outdoors as the summer started to roll around North America. Let's go for a run, a bike ride. Um, and these were all sports that we were targeting and focusing on. So um, yeah, basically that catalyst of kind of post COVID, um, you know, like May, 2020, it was just like where we saw our business start to really, really take off. And I think the story is that like, you can never actually forecast that. Like you, all you can really focus on, I'd say like what allowed us to do that was just focusing on what we thought the future would look like. And, and, you know, in this case, it was pulled forward a lot sooner and sudden, and we were able to benefit from that, but we were just building a brand for, you know, the, the 10 year vision and, and that was pulled forward and we were able to take advantage of that. And, uh, and yeah, it was just kind of like right place, right time, which is life, you know, like you can have yeah. a great brand and business in the wrong time and you can have a, a somewhat okay brand and business in the right time. And the, the outcomes are completely different. There's no guarantees in business. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying we were super geniuses. All I can say is that, uh, we stayed focused on executing on our plan and the market conditions kind of awarded us an opportunity and we leaned into it. Was there any marketing channel uh, that y'all doubled down on? Like, did you say, Hey, Instagram and Facebook, we're going to target, you know, performance athletes or runners or, or cyclists. And that, that took hold or was it organic that just kind of blew up because you were positioning yourself as a performance sock brand for four years prior and you had built that reputation with Google. I'd love to hear if you felt like, Hey, we, we capitalize on a specific channel during this time as well. I'd say like even to date and, and then we just focused on everything we had been doing. Like I wouldn't say like, Oh, overnight we're, 
we tripled our spend on Facebook or anything like that. We just continued. And I w- so I would say like the majority of the growth came from um, the organic kind of funnels we had built right. and just the organic kind of referral and people talking about the product because the benefit of the product as well is that it's very visual. And so it's a natural conversation starter. So there is an organic sort of viral loop that happens when people wear the products or every pair sold generally turns into a conversation. Um, so that's a benefit of the product category. And at that point there'd been enough of enough pairs sold and the market changed. So like the the conversation was just already started. Um, and then on the back of that, we just started learning more and just like increasing our spend, obviously, but even to date, um, the majority of our sales are coming from our, our retention audiences and organic sales and organic referral and brand ambassador networks. And we're obviously spending on, on performance, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Google, but, um, it's, it's not something that we're relying on to sustain the business. It, it is a, a big part of growth, but, um, I would say that, yeah, it was just a, a culmination and, and leaning into everything we were doing prior and just refining it. That's great. I mean, that's, that's the ideal scenario is to have those long tail or have performance marketing or paid marketing be things that you can scale when you need to, but have those channels that you've built and own or, or that are organic that you can rely on, you know, month over month. And, and those continue to compound typically, which is outstanding. So when you look at like an ambassador program, you mentioned that kind of early on as your strategy, like go back to your network of, of cyclists or mountain bikers and get them to wear the product. Has that continued to evolve for you with that same kind of community? And have you, have you been working on that for geez coming up on, you know, five, six years now? Yeah. So we have, um, it's still like a top level objective for us. I think the program's grown to over a thousand ambassadors now, of which are, are vetted. This isn't just like anyone and and everyone can join. It's been six years of like people that we we feel best represent our brand values and message. So like what we what we aim to do is put our product on people that they're living, breathing representations of the brand and the kind of lifestyle we we aim to promote. So um that program continues to be very successful. We, we do treat it very organically. There's no kind of paid compensation. These are people that we feel want to just integrate our product and we feel that they're a great um, ambassador of the product. And so they get benefits for being an ambassador, like a discount on product and um, a bunch of other opportunities that, that are, that are special and, and unique. Um, but we, we, we aim to keep it very community based and not transactional because we want that authentic kind of organic relationship and, and people talking about the product because they actually like it, not because we're paying them to say something about it in this world. I think, right. um, it's becoming exhausting to see all the influencers being like, you know, drink this or do this because they're paying me half a million bucks. It's like, well, you know, we're, we're the, 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 the average consumer is now sniffing that stuff out and knowing that it's, it's, you know, coerced is not the right word, but it's inauthentic. Right. Yeah. So um, we aim to keep it very organic and, and not transaction based. And I love the, the social aspect of it. I think the ambassador program plays to that, like regardless of if the ambassador is talking about it, if they're wearing it and people are seeing the prints, they tend to ask questions. And like, I think about a lot of the companies that have grown, you know, in the SaaS world or software world, like Calendly, like everyone knows the word Calendly because you get sent a Calendly link and you, you do like the Calendly, there's a social scale to it. And and your product, even though it's a wearable, has a very similar experience and that people can see it, talk about it, tell people where it came from because the prints do stand out and they are so unique, which is amazing. One other thing that you've done that I, I've found super interesting and, and one of the first reasons I reached out to you was you've created some video content on, on LinkedIn. You're, you're relatively active on LinkedIn, which isn't super common for you know, D2C founders. I see a lot of D2C, D2C founders telling their stories on Twitter, um, you know, doing some stuff on TikTok or, or Instagram maybe. But LinkedIn, I found this little world of D2C founders that are, are you know, talking to each other and engaging. What brought you on LinkedIn and, and you know, what's the strategy there if there is one at all? Or is it just somewhere you like to hang out and learn? Yeah, just to hang out. I think like it's just the the mature evolution of me, like spending less time on Facebook, Instagram and spending more time on Twitter and LinkedIn to just to like it's where my I feel like the people I want to hear from or the, the content I'm interested in is living right now. I'm not overly consumed anymore with kind of like the uh, the peacocking on Instagram and just like, look at me and all this stuff. And of course I'm on it and we'll post the odd photo too. But I'd say like, I gravitate way more towards kind of being in the conversation in, in LinkedIn and Twitter these days and, and shifting kind of 
what I consume to be uh, a little more uplifting and 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 uh, where I can learn. You know, that's more interesting to me these days. And and then you know, I've just started sharing my journey because you know, people that had shared theirs were so instrumental to me in the in the beginning years. And I try to have a very authentic way of telling our story. I don't hold much back. I'm pretty open with our numbers. I'm pretty open with the challenges we've gone through um, because, you know, business is real. And like, I'm hmm. kind of bored of and, and, and put off by all these people being like, look, I'm, I'm crushing it. And I've never had an issue. And like, we've just raised money. It's like, yeah, but your business loses money. So who cares? Like you actually right. don't have a very good business. Right. So it's like, I'm just, so I just wanted to kind of be a voice in the conversation that was like, business is hard you should make a profit. Like raising money is not as cool as you think it is. Like Hmm. there's, I I just, I was just annoyed with kind of the overwhelming voices of like the young startup founders thinking that like, it's all about status and stuff like that. And so I just wanted to be an authentic voice in the conversation and be like, look, I was a, an athlete with no idea what I was going to do with my life and a thousand dollars. And I just worked hard and built a business based on what I thought was cool and what people would want. And now it's a, you know, a business that's done over $10 million in sales. So it's like, you can do it, you know, and yeah. like, don't, don't be distracted by all these kids with like their little growth hacks and stuff like that. It's like, just have a good, cool idea, like be authentic, um, try to solve a real problem that you're curious about and, and like, you can do it. Love it. I love it. And w- one thing I mentioned, the video content uh, so everyone go check out you know Rob on LinkedIn or Twitter, which is where he he hangs out. Created some video content. You had a where, warehouse fiasco. How did that play out? Did we did we resolve it? We did. Yeah, I mean it wasn't <laughs> easy. So like yeah, like this Black Friday was in particular uh, in particularly challenging. We just had been growing so much throughout the year in terms of our inventory on hand as well as just our, our team, and you know we realized pretty quickly that like our infrastructure wasn't going to support what we needed to do. So we had to kind of cut our office in half, extend our warehouse. And it was just like hectic. And then supply chains were tough, but so we wanted to document kind of like, again, to be more authentic, like here's what it actually looks like to, to build up to black Friday. I could post on LinkedIn that, yeah, we did like over a million dollars in sales for black Friday. And that right. would sound cool. And I could like flex on that, or I could show you all the shit we went through to get there and realize that like, it's not just like, it's not just sunshine and rainbows, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like often more often than not very difficult. And, and also uh, like a six year overnight success. So yeah, yeah, we created like a seven, I think seven part YouTube series, just documenting each week as we got closer to black Friday. And it was a fun experience. And I encourage anyone that's just to check that out because it's, it's raw, it's authentic. It's real. It shows all the challenges and the wins, but uh is also just a cool experience to try and bring our community in even more into what we're doing and see that like we are human beings at the end of the day, you know, as a business grows, it's, uh, it's easy for people to forget that there are humans running this business. And you can see that with our customer service emails and some people are very nasty and you try and be like, Hey, like at the end of the day, remember, like we're a bunch of like people with like lives that are just trying to do our best. We're not like some gigantic corporation that's trying to suck the life and soul out of everyone. It's like, right. you know, like we're a group of now 20 people. This is college students. These are people with their first first career. This is me as a first time sort of entrepreneur figuring it out as we go, you know? And so like, uh, we want to show that that's who we are and that's what we're trying to do. We're authentic and real and we make mistakes, we fix them. And uh, yeah, we're, we're just doing our best. Love it. Rob, thank you so much for the transparency, the authenticity, uh, creating a really cool product. Everyone can follow Rob on LinkedIn, Twitter. We'll link to all of that in the uh, in the description. And check him out at EnduraApparel.com, E-N-D-U-R Apparel.com. We'll link to that as well. Rob, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Super fun. Thanks, Zach.